Welcome to this episode of You Should Read This, here again with Tom Vandaluba. And I'm Richard Atherton, and today we are discussing The Dawn of Everything, a new, and <laughs> Tom's holding up in Dutch for our Dutch viewers, a new history of humanity uh, by David Graeber and David Wengrow. Um, and this, uh, Tom, was your suggestion, and, and you read this first, so maybe it makes sense for you to uh, give us a, an introduction to and summary as to what this, this book is about. Yeah, thank you, Richard. Um, yeah, it was more or less coincidence. Um, I, I saw this book uh, a couple of months ago, and then during a summer vacation, I saw an enormous amount of people reading the book and posting about it. I, I actually wanted to read it during the, my summer holidays, but I didn't um, because I was spending time with my kids. And um, to start with the conclusion, uh, this is one of the seldom books uh, which, let's say, changed or, or has the ability to change narratives. And uh, if I like something about reading is, uh, and it, it happens not that often, that if you re you read something and then suddenly you say okay, the stuff I believed in until now has changed by reading this book, and this is such a such a book for me. So I'm 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 really happy uh, and glad that we can discuss the book, um, and also looking very forward to uh, to reactions um, because I think it's a it's a book which uh, creates or gives gives us the opportunity to discuss. Um, uh, let's say basic questions about uh, our society, so to say. Yeah. Um, well, let's let's talk about this this narrative, or it's a changed narrative. What 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 do you consider to be the um, the ways in which this book has given you, um, I guess, new possibilities for different narratives about society or humanity or history. I think there, for me, there are, let's say, two main uh, topics if you talk about, let's say, changing narratives. And uh, the first is that um, uh, I studied history and uh, I thought, OK, I went to university to, let's say, become educated, uh, let's say, develop a critical mind. Uh, and I thought, OK, this is a kind of ob objectivity. In, in how you are educated. And then this is one of those books where you find out it was not, let's say, there is no such thing as objectivity. Uh, and even, even if you think about, let's say, studying history as a kind of chrono chronology, how do you say mm -hmm. this? Chronology. Yes. Um, and then you suddenly have a lot of things which he describes where you say, okay, I didn't, I didn't study this in this way. Uh, so, to take one example is the whole idea of enlightenment and we'll let's say dive into that probably mm. uh, much more profoundly uh, where I thought okay that, that's a western invention there are those intellectuals in Paris they started to discuss those principles and then at a certain point we found out about uh, let's say uh, liberté uh, uh, égalité fraternité uh, this book is a c quite different, uh, let's say, story about about uh, the whole history of enlightenment. And the second topic is, and we'll also probably dive into this, is that if, let's say, structures or cities or societies become more complex, you need a kind of vertical hierarchy. I mean, I'm, I'm also used to this topic because, let's say, we implement in our company self-organization and I have some political background, rotation of leadership and this kind of stuff. So, so I already had some examples. That that I should let's say also see this as a kind of narrative, but that's also something where David Graeber and David Wengro dive into and come with a lot of interesting examples. Yeah, and it was that 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 second sh shifted narrative that you point to about uh, how um, we only get our civilization or, or large scale societies um, through hierarchy, right? through formal hierarchy. Um, is, is something this book blows away, which which I love. Um, but coming back to the the former point about the Enlightenment, and so how did this shift things for you in terms of your understanding of the Enlightenment specifically, and what does this book throw up? What I found extremely interesting, and I really didn't know that, 
is that that um, let's say when when the French or yeah uh, colonized the U.S., there were a lot of conversations with the let's say local inhabitants of the U.S. and this whole idea of that we invented uh, in the West, uh, those intellectuals invented this this whole enlightenment is is just let's say w- when i just read the books and i see the sources it's just not correct so uh jesuits and, and, and others they, they 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 went there and they and they documented their conversations with with those with those um uh let's say local local cultures uh on a very intellectual level and 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 uh, it was more or less the other way around so their societies who had those principles of uh, liberty, freedom, uh, egality, um, egalitarian society, and also one of those principles was only obey the rules if you really believe in this. And he also dives into this. Um, and and then let's say the French and those Jesuits they were influenced in a very severe way, a very strong way, by those conversations, they wrote them down. And those books uh, were very popular. So they were kind of bestsellers during, let's say, the end of the 18th century in Paris. And and what I find so striking is that during this period, those books have been written. There has been a very strong, uh, let's say, discussion in Paris about those books. They were very popular. And then let's say 200 years later, I study history in 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 university and I just don't know this. I just learn enlightenment as if it was a Western invention. And that's what I find confronting, but also interesting. So the conclusion on the one hand is there is not much such thing as an objectivity. Uh, so 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 at least this whole idea of a kind of discourse or kind of discussion or what I often call could the opposite also be true uh, is probably uh, um, a good exercise no matter what kind of discussion you have. And it's not about what you believe or what your own opinion is, but at least create more space for a kind of alternative or alternative thinking. Mm. Yeah, and and I thought that what was interesting, um, in in terms of learning about those exchanges with, as you say, often these these French intellectuals, or particularly in Canada, right when the French were um, colonizing Canada, and how they had to admit that many of these uh, native uh, natives of of that area were, were far better orators debaters uh that they were right yeah. and and so they were accepting that um that the societies there were were producing in some senses finer minds than than the french educational system was and they introduced this character who you know i grew to love reading the book uh candia ronk yeah. who was uh w- one of the elders there and um, this book reproduces some of those Exchanges. Um, I wonder if I should if I should quote one of them here just to give you a flavor yeah, I think of so, yeah. Yeah. What, what, what we're talking about. So La Hontan. Um, so this is um, this is in the context of 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 punishment and the and the judicial system uh, that's operating. Uh, so La Hontan, who's who's talking with uh, Candy Aronk, this uh, Native American. Um, this is what so La Hontan says. This is why the wicked need to be punished and the good need to be rewarded. Otherwise, murder, robbery, and defamation would spread everywhere, and in a word, would become the most miserable people upon the face of the earth. So, making the case for the you know the French justice system, and then Candia Ronk again, the, the Native American. For my own part, I find it hard to see how you could be much more miserable than you already are. And I was finding myself laughing out loud at these hundred-year-old quotes. Oh, Multiple hundred year old yeah. quotes uh, from from these guys. Um, what kind of human? What kind? Uh, what species of creature must Europeans be that they have to be forced to do good and only f- refrain from evil because of fear of punishment? We have observed 
that we lack judges. Um, what is the reason for that? Well, we never bring lawsuits against one another. And why do we never bring lawsuits? Well, because we made a decision neither to accept or make use of money, right? Here are societies with no money. Um, and why do we refuse to allow money into our communities? The reason is this. We are determined not to have laws because since the world was a world, our ancestors have been able to live contentedly without them. <laughs> And this must have blown, well, it was blowing the minds of these uh, intellectuals. Um, and it, and it, I suppose it gave them a whole new conception of what it might mean to be free, um, which was never really adopted by, like, by European societies, right? We kept our kings, we kept our laws, we kept our money, but it had a huge influence. Yeah, what I find, uh, I also love this, uh, this quote, and I thought, okay, one has to read this this books. So this this I mean mm. that's what David Graeber and David Wengro did. They went into those sources. So so they 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 just had a look. Okay, where did Rousseau take the stuff from? And they went deeper and deeper. And that's what you call primary sources when you study history. Mm. So so and then you read the stuff and you say, you just imagine those friends or it, I mean it's also 17th 17th century, not only 18th century. They go there. They have this kind of idea of total superiority and they have perhaps in a way that they have guns or their power and then you have those those uh, those, those leaders uh, and, and and they are different uh, let's say different um, people talking about Canada but also on other other parts of the of northern America and 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 they have those this intellectual superiority and they're just laughing at those at those French or this Jesuits and what and what is interesting is that those Jesuits uh, they were interested also in the intellectual discourse or the intellectual debate and what you just see if if you read this kind of 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 text uh, that they are influenced in a very strong way and there is a lot of sympathy for for what they learn from these conversations so I mean it's difficult for them in their cultural setting as it is for us now to admit that they are wiser and more civilized which you also see for instance in you talk about the whole climate or society or belonging or um, let's say mental problems etc and and another another example he describes or the author uh, described also a little bit to prove this in an indirect way if if people were between those societies. So for instance, if they stayed for a certain time with those, let's say local inhabitants, for instance, in their environment, and then they were, they wanted to go back to the Western society and they could choose, they would, they would even choose to stay in this kind of more primitive societies. Why? Because there was much more solidarity or much more belonging or Kind of a kind of, yeah, you can call it even a more human way of of connecting to each other, which also proves, in a, in a, on a, on a, on a, let's say individual individual scale, that if somebody lives in those two different societies, people feel much more attached to to this what we call more primitive societies, uh, which which I found which I found a strong example to, let's say, next to this more intellectual debate about is our society more humane or more equal or do we have more freedom? But I, I just I just imagining those French people going there and then somebody says, no, we are more free. I, we laugh about your society. It's just, it's just uh, who are you to tell me that, uh, that you from the West have a, have a more... Uh, Let's say a better society, or uh, why? Why do you think you're you're superior? Yes, that's right, and and that was it in both in both senses. So there, he he cited that there well the authors cite examples of um, children who would be taken from those native environments and brought up in in French yeah. families, and whenever they then got the opportunity to return, they would return and stay. And the same goes if if you took yeah as you say somebody uh, from a Western 
uh, society and and they spent a significant period of time they they also wanted to stay um and and part of it i perhaps links to this idea of freedom you mentioned it free freedom and they they, they use a definition the authors of, of freedom in this book which they use as a kind of a, as a yardstick i think to under to to judge the level of freedom a particular society is providing and they they define it in um along three lines so um it's the freedom to move away or relocate from one's surroundings and so to take that first one and we'll go through all three but w- what you found that a lot of these uh individuals in primitive sites could could travel widely right and yeah. they would they would try they would travel and they could travel between you know between areas you know with with no money but they're living in a in a network of relationships between between tribes and, and between the, the different societies that enabled them to to prevail on the hospitality of other tribes and obviously and the, and the skills yeah. and their abilities to travel um, and 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 gather food as they were traveling and they had that freedom and you compare that to take that first example with today there are many countries in the world you can't you can't leave um, you 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 just you you and or and there are certainly many places you you can't go to um, if you're from certain countries. And so these societies had had great levels of freedom in that respect. Um, you, you mentioned it earlier. The second is a, the, the ability to ignore or disobey commands. Yeah. <laughs> well, you you try disobeying the command of a policeman in in, in yeah. the West. Uh, yeah, you're not going to get very far. And then the third is um, shape new social realities or shift back and forth between different ones i mean who who right now in any western society has has any real power to shape how they're governed you you you, you, you got to live with what you got to live with you know that's the that's the reality for for most people living yeah, living in the what west what i also find interesting and I, I if you think about foucault for instance that punishment uh um I also see a direct link. Eh? So let's say punishment as society or to, to lock people up somewhere. Um, and the question is always who are being locked up somewhere, um, which is a very interesting philosophical uh, debate. And the other thing is if you talk about, let's say, being able to travel or getting food somewhere, if you see just, let's say, the tradition of Christianity and monasteries etc or even just can take the bible as an example it's always about helping people who are in need and there's also something where we are pretty far away now in our current societies so so and that's also something for instance which is extremely interesting if this let's say native uh, leaders are discussing with the jesuits with which have this kind of christian morale and then and then they say yeah but but if somebody comes by, uh, we always would help uh, them. We all, always would would be able to give food somebody to somebody. People people are even able to travel, and they will never they will never have a problem uh, about let's say getting getting enough food or et cetera et cetera. This this whole idea of hospitality is is goes to a moral level, and and that's what I find extremely fascinating. So I. I don't know if, if let's say those native leaders have have also read the Bible or something like that, but but they even would have been able to just to put the mirror up and say, okay, so where's your morale? Where's your morale? Please 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 explain me why you think you are much more superior than than our native uh, let's say native societies. Hey, you may be stronger, but we are from a moral point of view uh, superior to your society. Right. Right. And, and this was, I mean, you talk about this challenging narrative. So one of, I mean, I've always had very strong libertarian leanings politically, and I'd already always seen the sort of foundations of any libertarian society would need, is about property rights, so the ability to, for me to own my own property. Um, and that being, you know, foundational to, to living free, right, is that I, I can build my own house and I'm not, I don't need to worry about the government. Um, taking away my property right and and reading this book and understanding it is a lot of the basis of i suppose of libertarian political thought is based on the the, kind of the roman I, R- roman law right a lot of it yeah. comes has its, its its origins there 
and this this book talks about the foundations of Roman law being in slavery, um, and and a lot of that has its traces back to there. And so this idea that perhaps I'm I'm conceiving freedom through the lens of a a political system that's based around slavery <laughs> and how that might be flawed <laughs> has been interesting for me. Uh, and the flip that perhaps these societies with no no conception of property rights uh, and no subject, this conception of law per se um, may offer greater freedoms um, than anything we could conjure up you know, in, in the sort of Western system of thought. And that was uh, really challenging. Um, that I could be freer in uh, a law in yeah in a, a literally a lawless society. And that's not to say that these societies were always peaceful. I mean, that's the point being made, right? They they have wars. Um, they go to war with each other. Um, but the distinction, and this, let's just take the, the example of the Wendat, who Candia Ronk, who I quoted earlier, was a member of. They would have uh, wars with other tribes, but they would never, they would, this is the point that Candia Ronk, they would never go to war against themselves. There's no punishment towards their own people. And that was what he was found so fascinating about uh, Western society is that, is that we will murder our own people. We will put our own people in prison. Um, what I've what I also find very interesting is if you take this idea of freedom, because let's say in the book one dives, let's say also into this to this dimensions. Then, for instance, I, I don't know what page it is in my it's one uh, uh, forty eight. It's about Jesuit Lallemand, and then and then and then it's it, it's about freedom, and then uh, the the Wendat, um, uh, they they. They dive into this idea of freedom, and then it's about freedom as a as a practicality. So, is a freedom still free? A freedom if you if you if you if you can't act uh, uh, in 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 a way that that you have this freedom. So, so and 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 this is also a discussion we have. If you talk about let's say voting rights, you can have a right to vote, but if there is a lot of uh, let's say influencing the political system by spending money or uh, lobbying, etc. And the question is, okay, what what kind of rights are these rights in practice? And so you talk, let's say, you take one example: of freedom to travel, freedom to move or to move away. But it also got it also goes much further to what what are real freedom rights if you can't act accordingly. Uh, and that's that's something which we, I think, um, realize in our societies uh, very much. Although uh, we always learn about uh, one man, one vote. Uh, one man, one vote is not one man, one vote, uh, or one woman, one vote. Yeah, that that's right. Um, and and part of that is, and this is. This is the point they make is that one of the things that we do, well, you can say the West, but really globally, right? This sort of Western political system now is, is pretty much pervades the whole, um, yeah, yeah, the whole realm, right? But that um, we turn wealth into power through money and property. That's what our societies do, and that that's what di what's different about a lot of these uh, uh, societies. In North America, that we were studying, not just in North America, right? I mean, they study, you know, societies across across the world. But um, wealth didn't necessarily equal power. So I might be more wealthy in my in my tribe or my settlement. Maybe I have um, uh, more cattle or, or whatever it might be. But that doesn't translate to power. I don't because of that. I don't get to tell people what to do, um, and that's the big difference. Um, that if I'm a member of that society, I can still ignore your commands. I can still not accede to your requests, and and that's that's a huge difference, right? If I if if somebody has wealth in 
one of our societies today, we can turn that very easily into power, as you say, through lobbying um, or other processes. Um, but that's just not the case. Um, yeah, just not the case in these societies. I don't get more power if I become a wealthy. Yeah, it's, it's a, the whole book is also a kind of mirror for our current society where we still are raised with those basic beliefs, I would call it, uh, of the Enlightenment about uh, freedom, liberty, uh, equality, and fraternity, caring for each other. And, and you can put a big question mark behind those three basic principles. And that's, mm. that's done here in the historical context. Uh, but you can also put it in a uh, contemporary context. And that's also the starting point of of David Graeber, eh, who wrote uh, Bullshit uh, Jobs and uh, was one of the intellectuals behind Occupy Wall Street, etc. Uh, and they then also take the, the context of uh, anthropology, prehistorian uh, excavations, etc. And then and then they show, let's say, from 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 that perspective as well, that this whole uh, idea that that our civilization has to develop in a certain way because otherwise it would be anarchy. Huh? Uh, let's say in the in the in the in the in the negative way that it would be one big mess uh, is is at least something those two authors give a lot of examples that is not the case. So so this this second part that that we need hierarchy, perhaps even we don't like it, but there's no other solution than have a kind of fertile hierarchy. And if somebody doesn't obey the rules, you have to put them in jail. These are those narratives, which are just questioned and questioned in a very interesting way, because they give a lot of examples from the past where you have different solutions for, this, for the same problem, so to say, or for the, for the, for the, for the, for the same, for the same starting point or for the same question how do we organize our societies how do we build our cities how do we how do we supply housing to everybody uh, how do we distribute wealth etc this this uh, you can call this provoking but it's it's just interesting to to question our our own beliefs so to say yes yes and, and it's that second aspect that that fascinated me and all of the examples that the Gorbekli Tepe is a is a is a society he he talks about um, who who that was discovered by um, German archaeologists in southeast Turkey on the Haran Plain and they uh, they had very they 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 were non hierarchical uh, they didn't have uh, kings um, they were hunter gatherers or or and maybe some a little bit of farming, but they weren't farmers, as we would think of, of farming societies. And yet, they created monumental architecture. Yeah. So we 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 have this this idea. Well, it's almost like with with no hierarchy, with no kings, we get no cathedrals, right? We're not going to get yeah. big cities. We're not going to get uh, that bounty that a hierarchical civilization offers. And 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 the examples, and there are many in the book tell us that that is not true we can scale we can create um man-made wonders without the need for kings and hierarchy and, and that and that's what's fascinating it's particularly fascinating for me because we see examples of this in the modern workplace today with these companies a bit like busy that, that obviously that you're a, a co-founder of but uh, other companies where scale has been achieved without formal hierarchy and uh we can can do it and it obviously ha has been done uh historically um, yeah, or at on, least on let's the, say at the level of society i mean at least let's say he they describe uh those mechanisms eh, of uh let's say rotation or decentralized decision making etc which which Actually, we also know pretty well. Huh? So there are enough societies where, uh, let's say, if you, I was take the European Union, where you, or just let's say our European uh, 
uh, let's say countries where you have on a city level, you have certain powers and they are divided from, let's say, then the province and uh, from national politics. And people decide for themselves if they want to renovate the swimming pool of the city or uh, want to put their money somewhere else, etc. And, and let's say, depending on the country, it's it's it's, it's a clearer split. In Switzerland, this, for instance, you have three different tax bills. One goes to the city, one goes to the province, one goes to to the state, and you know exactly how much money you you pay for for what entity. Uh, so, so this idea of decentralized decision making that it makes sense is also something we 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 also have in our societies. But what what is so striking is that let's say if you if you just see this kind of pre historical excavations, uh, and that's also I find it a strong point. I mean, I, I haven't studied anthropology, that, but they have a lot of examples. So it's not that they have found one example. No, they they show that all all over the world, see, it's in Mexico or Turkey or Mesopotamia or whatsoever or, or Ukraine, they, they 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 find those examples everywhere. So so, and what's the strong point about this? It says, okay, this is not an exception. People on different places and different times found the same outcome they they built on a more equal way so so they just say this very practical you do those excavations and you're searching for a palace but you don't find one you only find let's say houses or apartments around the kind of courtyard they all have more or less the same size and then you have a city of i don't know hundred thousand or i don't know if it's if it's even much bigger i i, I think uh, if you talk about Mexico, etc., and they say it's it's in, in in comparison to Athens, Athens is a, is a, is a smaller than a village in comparison to those excavations in Mexico, and they say an enormous amount of people, and then they find a kind of structure, and then they find that there are kind of rotation structures or how people are helping their neighbors, etc. So in a very decentralized way, and then the question is how is this possible? This such civilized and 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 intelligent structures of of creating let's say big cities with an enormous complexity how did this work i i found it fascinating to read this yes um yes and and and, and particularly when we talk about the, these examples of of the cities where everybody had roughly the same house but well, this wasn't done through state communism right this wasn't done through a central uh command and control economy uh, as you say this i mean they're speculating to some extent exactly how those government structures work but as you say um the speculation is that it was yeah it was local decision making it was neighbor to neighbor it was something that was um i had to yeah, i had to think about also pol political uh, theory john rawls a uh, theory of justice uh where and that's what I also learned at university, that somebody says, okay, if you just imagine you're, you're born somewhere and you don't know if you were born from a wealthy family or or exactly the opposite, how would you organize a society? And the conclusion is you would like to have a quite elitarian uh, society because you don't know in which situation you would be in. And this is more or less, this is more or less practical, prehistorical anthrop anthropology let's say, view of, of this, that, that you say, okay, you have a huge city, you have 100,000 or half a million people. Uh, if I don't know, how, how would we organize this? And then we would probably come to the same conclusion. Let's divide in a way that everybody has a kind of certain space. And, that, and shall, we, shall we build a kind of structure where if you are in need, you have a neighbor who will help you because I will do the opposite as well. And huh? that's a golden rule, so to say. So. And that's what I find fascinating. Yeah, exactly. And that rules the idea that we want to sort of optimize society to give each new incoming yeah. member of it the best possible chance. I think gets the way that it then gets taken up is that, oh well, then we need a, a centralized state, you know, to to forcibly share the wealth so that everybody gets the best shot you know, when they enter this society. Uh, but that's not the only way. Of of thinking about how we might achieve that, uh, and I think that's what this uh, book throws up is, um, and maybe other ways to think about that. Um, the other thing I liked about this, um, and I didn't study history, but I still had this conception of history of it being linear, 
that that we went from these primitive hunter gatherers uh and then who then learned how to farm and it was through farming and the, the this ability to store a surplus that meant that they could then feed people who who didn't have to work the land so then we would get a priest class and you know uh an aristocracy uh and and those you know those thinkers could then allow us to progress in in other ways and and that would then enable us to create more sophisticated architecture uh and and then ultimately that 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 if you if that, that feudal system that that was one of the um outgrowths of of an agriculture agricultural um society uh then gave us an urban systems and then ultimately industrial systems right when we took that production to yet yeah, yeah, another level and that's been the that's been the hour of time and that's been our progress yeah <laughs> and, and yeah this this blows that apart it's like the, yeah you you don't have to go through all those stages to to end up at monumental architecture right you a hunter gatherer societies can can create uh, monumental architecture for example and so 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 i think that uh, and it's a this very western view i suppose that's the way to think about it is that we we must be the pinnacle of progress <laughs> yeah um and, so and it's it, something which let's say as a kind of a narrative so linear thinking the future will be better than the past and that's the way we mm. are let's say educated uh there are more and more topics where we can question this narrative. I mean, you can mm. you can talk biodiversity or climate or let's say mental health or even 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 purchasing power. So how how much money do you need just to to take the example of uh, let's say the company I'm 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 building with my colleagues? If you talk about mortgages, uh, how much how much income or What's the factor of the amount of incomes I I need to earn to be able to to buy a decent house for my family, as an example? Has this become better since the 50s or 60s or 70s, or has this gone worse? So there are a lot of all of those narratives. It doesn't matter what what you take, or let's say the amount of hours you work. You can take uh, Charles Dickens, etc. But if you just see, let's say, your parents. Most of the time, I said it was there was the father who had a salary and he was able to to earn enough to serve his family. He could go to college, etc. Talking about let's say the seventies or eighties, and now you have to work with two people to be able to earn enough money to to reach the same goals. Now perhaps we gone more uh, on holiday etc but so there's also a law also question about the purchasing power since the 80s did it go up for most of the people or did it go down so you have an enormous amount of different different uh, uh subjects where where i think we are in a kind of phase or situation now where it's not very difficult to question as we all experience this ourselves in our daily lives yeah and and I hear that argument a lot like you know let's let's go back to the let's say the 50s you know where where one income could uh could sustain a middle class family but you could that that's limited in thinking right go back to medieval times and there's that there's arguments I've yeah, heard that we that's that, correct. that it like one man a skilled craftsman could work I think for 45 days and provide for his family for the whole year and 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 people would work far far less, right? They, I mean, I think I had quoted, you know, it's about 147 days in a year that, mm. that people would work on average. Um, and a lot of the architecture that got built in those in those times was it was voluntary. So a lot of those cathedrals were built with voluntary labour mm -hmm. because people could earn enough to feed their families um, in a relatively short amount of time. So this this even the idea of a one person providing an income on a five day a week might look like you know, oh, an extraordinary I, uh, burdens of life to, to somebody, uh, you know, further back. But what I find interesting is just to question all those 
all those, let's say, kind of topics, which are just thought as if they are have a kind of it, it, eternal. Yeah, they, yeah, they are they are thought like they thought like they are eternal beliefs, so to say. So if you take let's take, take an example, a very simple one. If you have much more money, then you are happier, and then you compare. Or let's say if somebody wins lottery, then you must you must be much happier than you were before. Now we all know these examples. It's not the case. If you ask them half a year later, they're even less happier, which I find always striking. An excellent example. If somebody has a severe accident, you think, okay, uh, it's not worthwhile living anymore. No, you ask somebody in a in a wheelchair half a year later, same level again. So, so that's that's very interesting. That that it all goes back to a kind of kind of average level, no matter where you come from. But also, life expectancy goes down again in the UK and the US, as an example. It doesn't go. It, it it's not it's not one linear way up all the time and and it's not uh, a kind of i mean if you think about correlations it's always it's always this kind of moral superiority that that we're such a great species we're building better and better societies all the time but i think we live in a in in in, a, in times where we can question on a lot of dimensions we can question this are we happier than our parents are we wealthier than our parents do we live in a in a more, let's say, uh, less risky environment? Do we live in a healthier society? Do we feel more cared about, etc.? I mean, just to question all those all those questions is, let's say, from an intellectual point of view, I find this uh, refreshing uh, and also, in a way, very confronting. Yeah. Yes, and and we're seeing that. I mean, we're seeing now these uh, this this movement of conscious communities, and I know that there's that this is happening a lot in Mexico and parts of Central America where people are are getting together in groups and buying large sections of land and going back to live lifestyles very similar, it seems to me, as, as that described by Candy Aronk uh, and the Wendat. Um, it's, it's people are saying, well, no, that where we're at right now isn't the pinnacle <laughs> of a possible existence. Um, it, it, yes, it's... And and interestingly, and and you could almost argue, right, that there is a parallel movement which you and I are perhaps part of in the workplace of saying, um, yeah, let's let's go back to a style of organisation, um, that, yeah, is is not bureaucratic, is not sophisticated in the way that we might uh, think about, um, yeah, organisations today, and and that it's. Uh, it's it's much, you know, it's, it's it's actually you know much more efficient and a much happier place to be if we if we let go of a lot of um, um, what we consider to be uh, yeah um, necessities of of, of running a, a corporation or a business. Absolutely. I mean, the last sentence of the book is uh, we are surrounded by myths, and I think that. Um, that's that it's just 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 to take it much broader um my conclusion is always i should question much more and much much stronger the stuff i learned or uh the stuff i read or the stuff i see or stuff i listen to is this really true or as i always use as an example could the opposite also be true um is this is this is there also a kind of alternative idea to 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 what i think just just for the sake of of discussion or intellectual curiosity and it's not about it's not about let's say what what we see now nowadays doesn't matter what topic that it's much more you surround yourself by people who have the same opinion and if somebody doesn't have the same opinion about covid or doesn't matter what topic uh you don't talk to each other anymore now the mm -hmm. old idea of of let's say educating yourself is to surround yourself with people who have an opposite opinion to 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 uh, for the sake of the discussion the okay let's say what what can teach somebody else me with another opinion uh it's to sharpen your mind so to say 
that's that's what I find interesting. And that's what I, if I just read about those Jesuits and with their moral superiority, they discussed with those with those inhabitants on on a very respectful way. And I think yeah. this was much more respectful than the way we discuss nowadays. And it doesn't matter if it's populism or Trump or that's so how you can take or you just take the actual uh, situation in, in the UK. Uh, there there's always enough political political uh, discussion going on, but but uh, uh, let's let's just invite ourselves uh, to to discuss the opposite. Well, yeah, and I, well, and we don't create space. I think it's because we we don't develop a maturity, or a society doesn't allow us to develop a maturity in the ability to bait and reason and dialogue uh, with each other. We we have we have these these rushed lives, um, where we're very busy. Um, we don't we don't have time and space to develop in that way, and. Uh, and that's again what Candia Ronk talks about, and, and what gets observed um, in these societies that, that a lot more of a, a much bigger proportion of the day is spent in debate and dialogue. And it echoes something that I uh, I remember from a conversation with a company called Eight Pines in Argentina, who are a software company, and they don't have any formal hierarchy. And I asked them, "How do you how do you deal with leadership development?" And they said, well, we don't really have a, a concept of a leader here. Um, they're v- very flat hierarchy. We have citizens, and we think about citizen development within the company. And the way that we develop our citizens is, is that we have, we're constantly having open debate and dialogue about proposals to move the company forward. And people learn and cut their teeth in debate and dialogue by coming into those fora, proposing their um, solutions to problems or, or investments that they think the company should be making. And they learn to, to make their case and, and debate with others through that process. Um, so that is our leadership development. Uh, and I thought that was fascinating. And it has echoes of what we're talking about here, that the, the very society creates individuals who become you know, wise and reasoned um, through the processes that they engage in on a day-to-day basis. But what I find interesting is, let's say, those people that just wish discuss those those topics. I mean, they 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 were also leaders, huh? yeah. but but they were leaders with with let's say in in their in their in their societies. There were those mechanisms that you didn't have to obey if you if you wouldn't agree to the rule. And I think this 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 idea of Let's say kind of moral leadership, somebody who does the right thing because otherwise people don't obey. This is what I find extremely powerful. I find right. extremely powerful because it doesn't mean that there that is that there shouldn't be a hierarchy. If you if you call a hierarchy kind of way stuff is structured, but there are checks and balances in the system, and this is what we also know from our republican way of organizing states. You can't stay president for more than, let's say, two periods in, in the U.S. as an example. So you see these old ideas, of, and that's also described in the book. There are those, those even kind of scientific or mathematical principles of rotation, of, um, uh, let's say, helping each other. Or just if, 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 if a certain neighbor needs help, then, then the next one should help. And if... This one is not able to help, then the next one. So there are all those kind of of of, of rotation principles. They are also they also governing themselves. So so in those cities, one finds also kind of common spaces where people probably have discussed the way they they build those cities. So 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 as long as let's say people perhaps vote or choose somebody from 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 this group. Uh, that's totally okay, but there's a kind of moral leadership which also speaks from from those conversations with the Jesuits, which were written down, and that's what I found so powerful. So, so you can have power, and then if somebody doesn't obey the rule, then you put somebody in prison. But how powerful is leadership if somebody does not have to obey your rule? That's what mm. I find so so fascinating. Yeah. 
Well, and, and and it behoves then somebody seeking power and influence, or at least influence, um, to develop their debating skills. It makes sense that that people that would then create a society yeah. where people have much stronger uh, um, uh, ability to persuade others. And in fact, um, La Honten, who who met Candy Aronk uh, in, in Canada, um, he, he he said he'd never met anybody in his life who was as skilled an orator, who was as charismatic, who was as witty, who was as yeah. wise as this, yeah. this one individual. Uh, so, yeah, that's, um, a, that's a really good remark because that's what I find so fascinating that those Jesuits, although they had difficulties to admit that, that those native leaders were so skilled and so powerful, also from a moral point of view, they, 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 they still have this kind of self-reflection. And they write and I, that, that those people are much more uh, skilled in, 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 in their conversational skills, but they also explain why. Because if you only have, let's say, the power of, of explaining your decisions, you have to be very skilled because otherwise people wouldn't obey right. the rules. Yeah. And, that's, and that's something totally different. So it doesn't matter. What your opinion is, if you don't like it, I, I, will, I, will, I will lock you away. And that's, and that's, and that's more or less Foucault again, huh? that, that, that this whole idea of, 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 of using your power or abusing your power to, to lock away those people uh, you don't like or the opinion of those people you don't like. That's what actually, uh, yeah, which is a, a very interesting philosophical debate. Yeah? Uh, where are also, let's say, uh, frontiers or, or, or borders of, of things which are allowed uh, or, or not? I mean, if you just take the whole discussion about climate actions at the moment where people put soup on a, on a, on, on a painting, uh, but there is glass in front of it, and, 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 and then those people should be punished because they, it's not, you're not allowed to put soup in a museum on a painting, eh? although it's behind glass. That's where an enormous discussion is going on, and perhaps even less discussion about people who are ruining, let's say, our 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 globe. No matter in what in what I mentioned. So this whole idea, who's punishing whom for what, is a is a is a very fundamental uh, uh, discussion or question, which is which always has been there, and uh, which is discussed in those uh, in those discussions between the Jesuits and uh, and and those um, those leaders of this native. Um, uh, groups in North America. Yeah, and we and, and we now seem to be in an age where we we well we don't seem to have the spaces right now where we can have these kind of debates. Right? Yeah, it, it, we sort of we we take our arguments to the streets, or we do protests, and of course there's cancel culture. You don't like someone who's saying, "Oh, let's let's destroy their livelihood." And yeah, we 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 seem to right now be in a period right where uh, we. Yeah, we're losing or have lost a, a large um, part of our capability in that area to, to have dialogue. It, it would Good. also be a nice, a nice bridge um, just to, to end with a positive note. There's a lot of discussion going on about citizen assemblies and where, where people in a kind of random way, not totally random, but they're, they're chosen to, 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 to further develop our, let's say, parliaments or democracies. And then you get back this kind of, this kind of, let's say, uh, participation of of the society as as a whole, and not of a very small elite elite group which 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 sits in parliament, uh, to 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 change or or further develop our, let's say, our own uh, political uh, systems. So, but that's perhaps a topic for. Yeah, but it's the, important. To, yeah, it's, it's absolutely important to point to that. Um, that that that's what it stimulated me to do is to think about okay well how what can we envisage right yeah. we can't we can't start living like necessarily yeah. immediately like that's these, correct, these people yeah. in this society but what can we do and I love the the sort of pop that that the authors have at uh, Yovel Noah Harari um, they said in their conclusion actually there is so Harari writes there is no way out of the imagined order when we break down our prison walls and run towards freedom this is Harari saying this. 
we are in fact running into the more spacious exercise yard of a bigger prison. And that kind of nihilistic blue that we're kind of destined to this life of serfdom and servitude. And when you hear, yeah, Yuval Harari talk, he, he does seem to have this sort of somewhat, yeah. Uh, uh, yeah, uh, dystopian view for, for the majority of society, right? And we, we can absolutely reject that. We can actually absolutely be imaginative sure. and, uh, and imagine uh, new ways of organizing ourselves. And yeah, we are doing it in the business realm. There's no reason we can't extend that to society. Absolutely. Good. All right. Well, um, Richard, thank thanks you. once again, Tom. This was great. Thanks for um, suggesting the book. I really enjoyed it. Um, this really stimulated. Yeah. Uh, my thinking. Um, yeah, everybody should forward read to the, the next book. one. Yes. So let's remind people the, again: the dawn better, of everything. So what a better. Yeah, the dawn of everything. Uh, a new street. Thank you very much. Thank you. I hope you enjoyed this episode of You Should Read This with me, Richard Atherton, and my fantastic co-host Tom Van der Luba. If any of the material in this show resonated with you. If you're thinking, perhaps, how could I take these ideas and apply them in my own leadership or, or take them forward into my own organization, then I would love to have a conversation with you about that. If that feels like that could be a valuable use of your time, then please do click on the Calendly link in the description for this episode. and That will allow you to book a slot directly into my calendar. And I hope to speak to you soon.